Here is, uh, before we start on the story, actually it's related to the story, here is my family. My wife's name is Birgit, it means uh, precious, and uh, my name Steinar means stones, so together we are precious stones. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, so she adds uh, value to my life, you, know, you stuck here with the great, great part, right? And, uh, but uh, with my wife we become precious stones. And our family looked like this. This, is, this picture is taken in Azerbaijan. And uh, as you can see, this is Eirik. So he has grown a lot since that time. I look the same still. Right? But, uh, <laughs> but you can see the kids have grown. So, uh, but but uh, this is many years ago. I still wanted to show you this picture because the reason why I'm here with you and the reason why we have tent is, uh, is linked to this picture. Uh, before going to Azerbaijan, my wife and I, we had <clears throat> this feeling that God called, called us to be tent makers. I'm a journalist by profession, and my wife is, uh, at that time, she's a journalist today, but she was a uh, business administrator. So we said, uh, we worked for a traditional agency, I was the editor of their missions magazine, and then they opened this new mission field. And uh, we said, look, let's go as tent makers, and we suggested it to the mission board, uh, trying out this new model. I, I can find a job as a journalist, my wife can be a business administrator, we can go like that. And uh, they actually didn't like those plans, so they sent us more as traditional missionaries, although in Azerbaijan we were recognized as professional workers, because we started a, an NGO, uh, we did development work, and uh, people saw us as professionals, so we had that advantage of, of being uh, professionals. But then we felt that, uh, well, God, you wanted us to use our profession, so two years later again, same ideas came back. And now it wasn't just that we should be tent makers, but we should also start a resource center for tent making. It should be, the name should be Tent, and the name Tent in Norwegian means on fire, so it's a mm. playing with words. So you can see it probably in the logo, it's a fire and it's a tent, right? So, on fire, and uh, we said, it, it, name is Tent, it should be a limited company because we connect to the business world. And uh, so this, this is how we should operate. And we wrote it down, uh, the plans, we presented it again to the organization we work for. And we said, this is a, if you want to promote tent making, this is the way it should happen. And again, it was like, there was no engagement, no, they didn't support the idea. So we put the paper in the drawer in our desk and it stayed there for another year. Now we had been three years in Azerbaijan, paper was there, the plan was there. Uh, we kind of enjoyed life in Azerbaijan, but we still had, it. we felt we had this calling to do something else. And, uh, and then our uh, devotional book started speaking to us. I don't know if you use a devotional book, but we've used, I still use it actually, my utmost for its highest, Oswald Chambers. And uh, one devotion starts with short Bible verse, just says, arise from the dead. And then you can write many things about arising from the dead, but then also Chambers, he writes that uh, so many Christians, they have uh, received visions from God. They've written it down on a piece of paper and they put the paper in the drawer in their desk. It's exactly, it was speaking into our lives, like describing our situation. And he says, now is the time to arise from the dead and do what God has asked you to do. And I can tell you for 14 days in a row, that devotional book was speaking so directly into our lives that we were afraid of opening it. <laughs> well, what is he saying today? So then we started praying again and we said, God, uh, it's like we, we want to move on, but we need, even after 14 days, we said, we need a confirmation from your side that this idea of starting a new organization is actually from you. We needed to confirm that. And uh, we prayed and we prayed and we said, God, please confirm it. But there was like, there was no answer. Have you tried the same thing? You pray and you don't know what is God's will and you pray and you pray and there is no answer. So in the end, uh, we did something that I've done, I think maybe three or four times in my life. We asked for a sign and we said, God, if you want us to start a new organization, you have to send a person to us who says, you, you should start a new mission agency. If you do that, 
So there is a person like that, we will do it. If not, we're not going to do it. So then uh, we waited probably two, three weeks. 29th of February is an easy day to remember in 2000. We wake up early, my wife and I, and she says, immediately she says, I woke up with such strange feelings today. So it's like something good is going to happen. Maybe we'll have some visitors coming over. Over, I don't know exactly what it is. And I, uh, I mean, I trust my wife, but I don't, I don't always trust her feelings. So it's, I said, okay, maybe, maybe not. So that's fine. So I went off after breakfast. I went off to my work. She had a quiet time reading from uh, the Bible, Psalm 20, end of Psalm 20. Final verse says in the Norwegian translation, it's approximately the same in the English one, answer us the day we shout to you. So she felt like this Bible verse is standing up in front of her. And she says, like, today the answer is going to come. Today the answer is going to come. So I, then I came back from work. We, I was working in this microfinance institution. And uh, five of us, we sit down around the table. And I can tell you, my wife and I, we'd spoken about these plans uh, late at night. Uh, we'd shared it with a few mission leaders in Norway. So God could send anyone. And now uh, we sit down to have dinner. And as we're sitting down, Eric, who was five years, all at that time, all of a sudden he asks, how do you start a new mission agency? <laughs> Five-year-old, like, it's a weird question. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at him and I said, why do you ask Eric? And he said, I think you should start a new mission agency. <laughs> <laughs> so now I looked at my wife, and I looked back at Eric and I said, Eric, I think God just spoke through you. And he immediately turned to Trigve, his little brother, and he says, Shaiva, has God ever spoken through you? <laughs> <laughs> Immediate reaction, right? <laughs> but then he's like, we talked, my wife and I, we said like, okay, we asked for a sign. We thought it would be an adult. Yeah coming, saying to us in King James. <laughs> no, I should know. Yeah, I said, so says the Lord, thou shalt start. <laughs> that, isn't that the way God is speaking? Yes. Yeah. Thou shalt start. <laughs> but, but now it came from a child. And it was our own child. And we said, it, it, can we trust this? Can we really trust it? And we said, well, we asked for a sign. We didn't specify the age of the person. <laughs> <laughs> So now we have two options. We can either we can either do this, we can start, or we or we can be unfaithful. So we said, let's be faithful, and uh, that was kind of the confirmation, and we started from there. Uh, the story made a, a huge impact on Eric. I was driving him home from nursery a few days later. He was sitting in the back of our car, and uh, all of a sudden he asks, "Daddy." Am I a prophet? <laughs> Forms his identity, right? Daddy, am I a prophet? What would you answer in that situation? Yes. Well, God, yes, yeah, God spoke through you. Actually, so uh, this is where we worked. We worked in Azerbaijan, and uh, here is the Caspian Sea. Uh, Iran is here. Turkey, Armenia, Georgia, and Russia as the surrounding nations. And we, we lived in this city that's called Ganja. And, uh, it's the second biggest city in Azerbaijan. I come from the second biggest city in Norway. And the second biggest cities, they have something in common. It's like uh, you want to be, uh, you're fighting to be uh, famous, kind of, that mentality that we're the little brother, but we want to be visible. So I could use that for all it was worth in, uh, in uh, Azerbaijan. When I spoke in public, I said very often, I said to people, it's like, I come from the second biggest city in Norway, and we live in the second biggest city here, but even if Bergen is the second biggest city in Norway, it's still the cultural capital of Norway. And my dream is that Azerbaijan will be the cultural capital. No, that Gandhi will be the cultural capital of Azerbaijan. And he said, finally, yes, <laughs> there is someone seeing the potential in this city. <laughs> and uh, that was wonderful. So, uh, second biggest city. Okay, this is... Azerbaijan was kind of hidden inside the Soviet Union. And uh, uh, 
Then uh, in the Soviet Union, they had two kinds of cars. One was this car, the luxury car. It's called uh, Volga. Have you seen a Volga? Never. That's the Mercedes of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Uh, and then you have the other option, which is the Lada. Looks like this. Have you seen a Lada? Yeah. Yeah. You've had it here in US or yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not. It's not a good car. <laughs> It's not reliable. We bought a brand new, we, we were missionaries, right? So not going for the luxury. We go for the, the, the more simplified version of a car. And uh, we bought a brand new one. And because it was new, we only had to bring it to repairs every second week. Uh, the, the good thing with a Lada, when you drive it in the former Soviet Union, is that when the engine stops, before you lose your speed, is there is always a place where you can get it repaired, right? It's an easy car to repair, and uh, there's always a place uh, for that. So, Lada is not a reliable car, but uh, you can always, always get it repaired. And uh, here is Lada, the evolution of Lada versus BMW. And if you look at it from 1972 till 2010, this is how BMW evolved in that. Uh, Period. And here is Lada in the same period. <laughs> <laughs> so then they have this slogan, they say, Lada, perfect from the beginning. <laughs> Why change something that's perfect? Right? <clears throat> so uh, you have many jokes about Ladas, of course, because it's so unreliable. So how do you double the price of a Lada? You know that? You fill up the gas tank. <laughs> What do, what do you call it when you see a lot on top of a hill? A miracle. It's a miracle, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. And uh, what, do you know what the speedometer says when you pass uh, 40 miles per hour? It says game over. <laughs> so that's a lot of. And uh, here, since we have uh, now, uh, we, I mean, this is 2019. I have a video from the future. When my wife and I, we go back to Azerbaijan, and you will see we, we're aging a little bit. But again, we're driving a Lada, and uh, this is what we look like at that time. And it's a fun car to drive. Look at this. Soviet Republic. Uh, it got its independence in 1991, so we came five years after that. And uh, the way uh, the economy was organized in the Soviet Union was like you no know, republic was actually, I mean, they were transporting things around in the Soviet Union, so no republic could independently kind of finish one product. So there was a full breakdown of uh, the economy in Azerbaijan and in many other republics at that time. So people had, there was an infrastructure, but very little money. People had houses to live in, but no food or no money to buy food. So a difficult time. Uh, Azerbaijan has huge oil reserves. Norway is today one of the wealthiest nations in the world because we have had oil since the 1970s. And uh, uh, the oil reserves in Azerbaijan, which are very much subsea oil reserves in the Caspian Sea, they are bigger than what we've had in Norway. So it's huge oil reserves. Unfortunately, that is not impacting the nation so much because there is enormous corruption in Azerbaijan. Enormous corruption. When we lived there, it was always among the worst five nations in the world when it comes to corruption. Very, very corrupt. And we saw how that destroys a nation from the inside. I, I, I talked, the, the neighboring boy was taking, taking an exam at university. He came back and I asked him, how did the exam go? And he said, it went pretty well. I only had to pay $50. Uh, 
So I said, was that the only thing they asked you for? And I said, he said, yes, that was the only question on the exam. Please pay $50 and you've passed. <laughs> oh, wow. So no test. And uh, people had papers, but you didn't know if they had any knowledge behind the paper, right? So, so it was very, very difficult. Here is this guy uh, was the uh, Ilgar Aliyev, the, the man in the back, Ilgar Aliyev. He was the president when we lived there. When he passed away, his son was elected as the president. This is a typical uh, corrupt setup, right? So his son was elected, Ilgar uh, Ilham Aliyev uh, is the son, and he is still also ruling uh, Azerbaijan as the, as the president. And in one circle outside Ganja, he got more than 100% of the votes. It was even in the newspaper, more than 100%. You wonder how that is possible. <laughs> like he was so popular, right? So you can even go beyond 100%. Eight million people live in Azerbaijan, 99% are Muslims. And the majority of the Azerbaijanis, they live in uh, like uh, that people group. They live in Iran. And as you can see, the Azerbaijan is bordering Iran here. So here in northern Iran, you have 17 million uh, Azerbaijanis living here. And you have 8 million approximately in side of Azerbaijan. So what, one thing we're trying to do is to uh, train tent makers from Azerbaijan to go across the border into Iran. Iran. Because if you come as a, as a Westerner, uh, you're too visible in the Iranian society. Mm -hmm. But if you come in as an Azerbaijani, they, can, they look the same. And they can also get a 10-year multiple entry visa to uh, to Iran, whereas we usually we get a one-year visa if you get the visa at all. Mm. So uh, training local Christians uh, to go across the border is is good, and it's happening today. Many Azerbaijani Christians are traveling across the border, and they're starting uh, small fellowships in Iran. So we were here from 1996 to 2000. As I told you, we lived in the second largest city in the nation. We did microfinance. Uh, we did a cultural exchange program. We built relationships with people, and we uh, were there to plant a church. And I will share about each part here as we, as we move on. And feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Are you familiar with uh, microfinance and how that works? Yes? Yes, you are. Yeah, this is how we operated. We gave loans to poor people, and uh, we founded this microfinance in 1999, and uh, because we charged uh, quite high interest rates, we were profitable already after one year of operation. So here you are to help poor people, and, uh, and then uh, how, how much do you think like we gave loans, how much do you think we charged uh, as interest? You have the poor people there, and you want to help them. Well, what would be a reasonable interest rate to charge? 10%. 10% per year. Well, we charge more than that, actually. I'm going to guess more like 70 just because of the default ratio. Yeah, you say 70. Mm -hmm. It was less than that. Okay. Yeah, we, we charge 3% per month. Yeah, 3% per month, so 36% annually. Do you think that's a good way of uh, helping poor people? <laughs> no. Charging that much? I can tell you that the start of the process, if you wanted to have a loan, you came to an information meeting, like, like they sat down like here. The room was packed with people though, because they saw that here we have access to capital. And then we explained the whole process, and we said, this is, these are the conditions, and, and uh, you have to pay 3% interest per month. And when we came to that information, they started laughing. 3%? How is that possible? Because their alternative was to get money in the black market, mm. and they had to pay 15 to 20 percent mm -hmm. per month. Wow. So this was so much cheaper. It felt for them like we're getting this capital for free. So that's the way of helping. It's still a way of helping. And at the same time, we made a solid income, so we could actually run that as a as a business. And uh, it, it it took off. Uh, in an evaluation report in 2002, so after three years of operation, uh, there was an external eval evaluation and they said that 1,000 new workplaces had been created through people getting loans from this bank in just three years. I couldn't believe it. How is that possible? But I can tell you when we, when we started this bank, we contacted the local authorities 
the mayor in the city, we explained to him what we were planning to do, and he said, we, Canada doesn't need any project like this. We need big investments. Someone coming with lots of capital, investing and employing people. After uh, operating for a few years, he was very happy with what he saw, because he saw there is new activity in the city, new things are going on. Mm -hmm. Today, this fund has, uh, in the fund itself, it has 110 employees, and it has uh, branches in three cities, and more than 19,000 customers. So it's still, still there today, it's 20 year anniversary uh, this year. And uh, in 2009, it was rated among the top microcredit funds in the world for user involvement. It's, we had we invited people from uh, among the uh, customers to be on the board. And then we got this prize because of user involvement <coughs> in, the, in the operation. One thing we did, and uh, I think that was wise, uh, you wonder if you can, uh, can you collaborate with corrupt authorities? Well, uh, you know in Azerbaijan, because of the corruption, we were always asked to pay bribes. And uh, to fight that, we invited the uh, deputy mayor of the city to be on our board. So second in rank in the city. And he said yes. So every, th every time someone came to ask for a bribe, we called him. <laughs> and he said, can you take care of this? And he always said yes, I can. Yeah. And the yeah. team went away. Yeah. yeah, my question is, um, who was running this microfinance? The government of Azerbaijan or we Norway don't. government? Or? No, it was we. We started this NGO. It was, it was called so, Norwegian Humanitarian Enterprise. Okay, it's so a no non profit. It's a non profit organization. Yeah. It's a Christian non profit? And we started it as a Christian non profit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we it was registered as a Christian non profit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that was that was doable at that time in Azerbaijan. Yeah. So, uh, mm. so we ran it. We controlled it for as long as we could. It's still owned by this organization. It has changed name, but it's still owned by the same organization uh, today. So, uh, I I I have to say that kind of I can I th 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 this is a good way. From my experience, this is a very good way of fighting poverty, providing loans to poor people, so they can take an initiative and start things themselves. And uh, you, you kind of, everyone, uh, I mean, you beat people with dignity, it's like you, you keep your dignity, right? It's not like I'm here as a strong guy helping you, but it's like, you know, I'm getting, you, you're getting this loan, you have to pay it back. Right? So it's, it's like we are on the same level, you're a customer, I'm providing the service, and uh, and many people they they really use that chance of uh, making a better life. And then, of course, when you establish something like this, where there is so much money involved, it's uh, it's uh, people test your systems initially, and uh, they wonder if they can get away with not paying back. And you have to treat them. You have to take the first ones really seriously, right? <laughs> So, and how do you do that in a corrupt society? That, that wasn't easy. So we, uh, first one who didn't pay back, we informed the police. He owed us $400, and they arrested him. And he had to pay $400 to get out of prison. Uh, but we never saw the money. It ended up with the police. Right? So we lost the money. So then how do you do it then? It's like we, we brought one person to court, Whoever pays the judge the most will win the case. It didn't work. So what do you do? And we ended up actually taking collateral from people. And we showed kind of, if people showed no willingness to pay back, we showed no mercy. And we just sold the collateral and we got our money back. And uh, they were no longer customers with our bank. But it is very hard from you because you <laughs> it's like you come with a tender heart, right? You want to you want to help people, and then you have, you have to be very firm. And it's so easy to go out of business. It's so easy to lose your money. But uh, then, it's, then you don't have many people. If you can make the money circulate, you can help a lot of people. You can reuse the money over and over again. Mm -hmm. 
So here, here are some typical customers. Uh, Ulvi, uh, we went into milk production. Uh, at this time in Azerbaijan, you could buy a cow for $350. And just by selling the milk, you could pay back the cow in uh, six to seven months. And if people pay their monthly installments on time, they got the second loan after they paid back the first one. And the second loan was typically twice as big as the first one. So now they could buy two more cows. One was paid off. So after 12 to 14 months, they had three cows that were paid off. So you can see, kind of their income grows quickly. And then we also make an income. Here is Adil who ran a bakery and because of the loans, he could get uh, buy better equipment or he could buy more flour. Uh, get a better price and make more profit. And here is Ilgar, who traveled to Moscow to buy products for the bazaar. And because of the credit, he could buy more on each trip and then make more profits and expand his business. So typical customers. The first loan people could get was between zero and $500. Maximum amount was $500 for the first loan. And uh, then second loan was up to $1,000. And then they grew from there. And typically when they needed more than $5,000, $6,000, they kind of got, uh, they grow out of our system. Then they have to go to the local bank. So it worked well. We made money. Uh, it's rumors spread in the city that we did things the right way, that we were honest people. They knew we were Christians. Uh, so that was good, uh, and um, I, had, I had people even coming to my office, uh, like, even to me as a foreigner. One person came and he asked, he said, like, if you can make sure that I get a loan of $500, I will pay $100 in your pocket <laughs> when I get the loan. And uh, I said, I can't do that. And he said, why not? No one will know. And I said, I have to stand in front of an almighty God with my life. I can't do it. And he was a Muslim, so he says, yes, you're right. <laughs> we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. We had people from the local bank coming to get a loan in our bank. Believe it or not, we asked them, why are you coming here? You have your own bank. And they said, well, in our bank, if the loan contract says we have received $1,000, we only receive 800. But here in your bank, we receive the full amount. Mm -hmm. So this is a better deal for us. So we were seen as honest people doing things the right way. And that kind of served uh, our purpose. Like we helped the society, and people were also attracted to this honesty. Then we had a cultural exchange program, and we brought art from Azerbaijan to Norway, and from Norway to Azerbaijan. We, in, in the former Soviet Union, you have lots of artists, musicians, painters, <laughs> The handicrafts people, um, carpet makers. So there's so it's like the cultural the culture is so much alive and so much to play on. So it was a great to to bring this back and forth and just introduce people to uh, Azerbaijani art. We worked with musicians and we even made very early on we made uh, this CD with a mix of Azerbaijani and Norwegian music. And the, the cover is there. Uh, it, the title is The Land That We Came From. And uh, as you can see, there is a church on the cover. And we wanted to point back, because Azerbaijan was actually from year 300 to 700. It had been a Christian area. And then we wanted to point back to people's spiritual roots. And we said, like, before Islam, you were Christians. So we could point back to that. This is not a new faith that we bring from Europe. You had it even before it came to us. Yeah. And uh, this, these are the musicians, uh, famous musicians at that time in Azerbaijan. Lilianta Dasheva, she was a famous singer. And it, it was a very high profile project, this uh, CD. And I, got, I was the director of the work there. I was even interviewed, believe it or not, on CNN. Maybe you saw that. In, this was in 1997, I think, 96, 97. Did you watch CNN at that time? You may have seen me. <laughs> Wish I had a clip here. But uh, do, you know, do you wonder what it sounds like when you mix Azerbaijani and Norwegian witchy music? Yeah, I have, I have a sample file here. So this is a witchy choir singing. 
And then you will hear Brilliant Adasheva coming. Turkish music, right? Does it, it sound like no no it doesn't sound like the Pali music? <laughs> so the, the choir it sings in Norwegian and the brilliant Badashiva sings in Azerbaijani. Yeah. Fun fun to work with uh, musicians like that. We also have concerts every month uh, in our city with Ganja State Chamber Orchestra and uh, our mission became the main sponsor of that chamber orchestra. Uh, well, what do you think about that? A mission organization being a main sponsor of a chamber orchestra. <laughs> Is that a wise uh, use of your money? You know, we, we thought uh, it was a very difficult time in Azerbaijan at that time. And we, we, said, we asked God, we said, well, what can we do here to give people hope for the future? And then uh, we said, well, um, you know, if people can see that their own culture is still alive, mm -hmm. it can bring hope. And if they can experience beauty, mm -hmm. it gives hope. And then we found this chamber orchestra, a professional orchestra. And uh, we said, let's, let, let's have concerts once a month. And we had these concerts in an old church building, believe it or not. That was the place they rehearsed. And uh, because of the Christian uh, era in the Azerbaijani history, you find a lot of churches there. It's called all Albanian churches. I know they had concerts, we had concerts also in the church. Well, just before we came to Azerbaijan, there was a law passed that said that as foreigners, we couldn't do any religious propaganda. So, but because I was the director, I was allowed to have an opening speech at every concert. And you want to share with Christ, right? Because now you have, all of a sudden, 200, 250 people gathered in this church. <laughs> so how can you do that without doing any religious propaganda? And uh, you know what we did? We did, uh, we did uh, Christmas concerts, we did Easter concerts. Uh, and I, we said, uh, I said, like, instead of sharing the gospel, I just, I just told people what had been shared in that church at that time of the year, right? So I said, we are here in this church. And at this time of the year, people came together to celebrate Christmas. And this is why they celebrated Christmas. And then I could share the whole Christmas story. <laughs> Same with Easter, right? And we always had people from the local municipality, local authorities, they were sitting on the front row, listening to this preaching, but they never complained, absolutely never complained. Also, you could share that music is, uh, a part of the new earth, right? It's a part of heaven. So how we can give this beauty to God. So so many things you can share without preaching uh, too much. So we found that to be a good way of, of spending uh, our money and investing in that type of orchestra. And then we also, our organization, uh, worked to restore this old church that we found in a little village. And according to the local tradition, this is placed in a village called Kish. According to the local tradition, this church was built by a disciple of Jesus' brother, Jacob. And it was built in the year 70 after Christ. Wow. I mean, in Norway we got the Christian faith was introduced in year 1000. But this was from year 70. So we thought, that, that's an interesting story. Can it be true? And in collaboration with the with the uh, university, 
in Baku and uh, archaeologists from there. We brought them up there and they started investigating if this could be dated back to year 70. They found out that the oldest part of the building could be dated back to year 300. So it's very, very old. And then together with the museum uh, and our organization, it was made into, uh, together with the uh, university and our organization, it was made into a museum. Unfortunately, they found out that this place had also been a pre-Christian worship place. So it's like now it shows the spiritual roots of Azerbaijan and we wanted to start with the Christian faith <laughs> but then before that they were fire worshippers so now it's, it shows that okay first fire worshippers and then Christian faith came and then Islam came it kind of shows those spiritual roots but uh, it's still there I mean people can be interested also in seeing that okay the Christian faith was here very very early Church planting, we did that. We saw approximately 60 people being baptized in the four years we were there, from coming from a Muslim background. I don't know if you feel that as much or little, but uh, it's, uh, for us it was just amazing, and especially the last year, we felt like most of these people came the last year, and we felt like every, every week there is a new person saying, I want to, I want to receive Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It was just amazing, an amazing time to be there, and uh, th this is our dream. We really want to experience that again. We had a local leadership in, uh, in the church from the very beginning. We actually invited the man you see here, Adil, uh, to come and join our team in uh, Ganja. He came from, he was already a believer, uh, lived in Baku, which is the capital, and now he came to join us and uh, be a part of our team in, uh, in Ganja. Uh, we had to divide the church into house groups because of uh, some kind of persecution and police actions. And uh, it hindered the growth for a while. And uh, still, I mean, after we left, the church has not grown that much. It's the same numbers today, probably new people. But it has remained at the same size, approximately 60, 70 people altogether in those groups. I was responsible for the training of young leaders. And uh, that was uh, exciting and uh, difficult because Training people in former Soviet Union was totally different from training people in Norway. And uh, I mean, people in the Soviet Union, they were not kind of taught creativity. And uh, they were taught that there is one right and one wrong answer to every question. So I, I still remember, it's like you, you want to study the Bible with these young leaders and you say like, uh, okay, so you go through one parable of Jesus and then I ask them, what do you think this means? And there was always no answer. No answer. And then one guy says to me, so why don't you tell us? You know already, Stan. Why don't you tell us the answer? Why do you want us to say something that's wrong? Why don't you just tell us the answer? But I wanted them to find out and interpret the, the text. Right? The key to this church growth, I think we found um, at the end of our stay in Azerbaijan, we, we went to visit uh, a Baptist church, Russian Baptist church. And it had been there as a persecuted church in the Soviet Union. And now it was a church of elderly women. Probably the average age, and this is back in 2000, the average age of the church was probably around 70, 75. They had this uh, pump organ, they sang old Russian hymns, and uh, met in a little room, only women. And then we talked to the leader after the service, and she says, it's fantastic what's happening in Ganja today. She says, we have, at this church has been praying every day for 50 years, 5-0, every day for 50 years, we have prayed for people to come to Christ in our city. And now we can see that it's happening. Mm -hmm. And they really rejoiced. None of, them, none of those new believers came to that church. That church was dying. Mm -hmm. But it was like they saw the kingdom is growing, right? Our church is not growing, it's dying, but the kingdom is coming. And uh, the answer to our prayers is coming, and we have fulfilled our mission. I just find that to be a wonderful perspective, isn't it? Like you have a dying church, and still you can rejoice that people in our city, they're coming to Christ, and it is an answer to our prayers for 50 years. Have you prayed for anything for 50 years every day? It's a long time, isn't it? <laughs> it's a very long time. I'm, all, I'm 
I looked like this, I'm 53 years old. And I didn't start playing for something every day when I was three years old. So 50 years, that's, uh, that's really a commitment for the kingdom task. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> so some learning points for us in Azerbaijan. Hospitality uh, was a constant challenge. We came from, uh, I regard myself uh, as a hospitable person. And my family name is Opheim, which means open home. And we try always to invite people in. So uh, still in Azerbaijan, we met an, uh, a hospitality that went way beyond everything that we could offer or ev everything we expected. It's, it's like, I mean, we have Muslims coming to Norway. I've talked to, I talked to a young guy, he says, it's say two years in Norway, he says like, uh, my biggest dream is to be invited to a Norwegian home, but it will never happen. And then I was just reflecting and thinking, we came as Christians to a Muslim nation, and we were embraced from day one. I told you earlier today, right, that they even had a welcoming party in our home when we arrived. And following days, we didn't know any word from their language, but they just invited us. Welcome, welcome to our society, welcome to our city. But it became a challenge as well, because you feel like you lose control over your time. And uh, also over kind of family time. So the solution for us, and maybe I, can, I, I, I want to share this as an idea for you as well. The solution for us was because we knew that if someone rings the doorbell, we have to take you, invite them in. So uh, we lost control. But the solution for us to get family time was to actually uh, go away. Every week in the summer half year on Saturdays, we took the family in the car and we drove away to a city where we had no res responsibility <laughs> just to have family time, time off. You go away. If people ring the doorbell when you're away, you can't open the door. So that was the solution for us. So a constant challenge, and uh, we had more than one culture to relate to. Often uh, the mission culture is a culture on its own. It can be very hard to define and relate to, and we struggled with that. We had conflicts on a team. We had to work hard to get time off. And uh, I mean, the hospitality, just to explain how it goes beyond your borders. Uh, I like to, I, I'm a morning person. I like to go to bed early. Uh, Azerbaijanis like to stay up late. They sleep in the middle of the day. I didn't adapt to that. I take naps in the middle of the day as well, but still I have to go to bed early. So my, usually I go to bed like 10, 10, 30. We have people coming to visit us at 10, 10, 30. <laughs> and then you sit down and you start talking. And it's talking in a, a foreign language when you're very, very tired is, is difficult. So two times, one time, uh, two, two times it happened that I fell asleep and people were talking to me. One time I'd probably been quiet for an hour because uh, I couldn't speak in Azerbaijani. I was, I was too tired. My brain had stopped working. And this guy, he just continued to talk and talk and talk. And then all of a sudden, I can't remember, of course, because I fell asleep. It's like, I just felt my eyes were so heavy. It's like, and then all of a sudden, I wake up because he's, he's, he's doing like this. <laughs> Steiner, Steiner, you fell asleep as I, was, as I was speaking to you. And then he wakes me up. And he continues to speak for another hour. <laughs> it's like, you know, in my country, if, if, if I was visiting you and you fell asleep, I would have left silently, not waking you up. Right? Okay. He was very tired. So that's it. But here he wakes me up and he continues to speak. So that was the hospitality. We had only one, one time in my life, uh, in, uh, in our married, married life, we have experienced that my wife and I have been sick at the same time. And uh, we had eaten some bad food. And uh, then we started throwing up, you know. And uh, as we did that, we had a window to the neighbor. So neighbor knocking at the, at the window. Neighbor, they're shouting to us now. Are you sick? Yes, we're sick. It's like, yeah. OK, we're coming over to help you. <laughs> no, thank you. Like, <laughs> we don't need that. Yes, yes, we're coming, you know. <laughs> and then two minutes later, they're, they're there. And, uh, and they, they pour this bad milk, you know, in a glass. And it says, like, drink this, it will help you. <laughs> and my wife still admired me for doing this, because I, I, I took the glass, I emptied it, 
the grandkids. And then I said, I feel much better, so you, you can leave now. <laughs> it's like, and we worked hard to get them out to our home. And then we took two buckets, you know, and we went to the other side of the house, and we continued to store up. <laughs> but people come when you don't want them to be in your home. And that's the, that's the hospitality you have to face. So it's not so easy. Church planting, what did we learn? We learned that everything worked for one purpose. We did microcredit for the Lord. Uh, people from the, uh, among the customers, they got attracted to Christ because of the honesty, because things was done in the right way as they saw it in our fund. And they wanted to learn more. And they got attracted to, uh, to the church, they wanted to learn more, and they became believers. We saw the culture work working in the same way. That people got attracted to the beauty of the music, right? They saw that these people, they see the value of the culture in our society. We want to learn more about who these people are. And then we saw that also the church planting worked for the same purpose, leading people to Christ. And uh, before going there, I, I had this understanding that probably we, yeah, we need to do the humanitarian work to stay and lead people to Christ. But after being there for a while, like, I got this tent-making uh, understanding that everything actually works together for the same purpose. So, uh, praise the Lord for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.